Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Dr. Robert Brodsky, the Director of the Division of Hematology in the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Brodsky and his colleagues published a recent article in the journal Blood, outlining evidence for a theory of why COVID-19 causes blood clots. This theory has to do with a part of the immune system called complement. Let's listen. Thank you so much, Dr. Brodsky, for joining me. Initially, when the world heard about a new respiratory virus, it was a big surprise to find people with COVID-19 getting blood clots, strokes in their brain, heart attacks. You're a hematologist, an expert in clotting. What, what has been going on with, with these patients? You're, you're absolutely correct. And one of the big problems with this virus, and in, in, in at least a significant portion of patients, is they do develop blood clots and they have damage to their endothelium or the lining uh, of the blood vessels that supplies not just the lungs, but the kidneys and the heart and other, other organs as well. And uh, as many as 10 to 15% of these patients can have uh, severe blood clots. And the other unusual thing about these blood clots is that we prophylax all patients uh, with, with blood thinners who come into the, to, to the hospital. But these patients seem to need more. And uh, the same doses of anticoagulation or blood thinners that work in the average patient don't seem to work as well in patients with COVID-19. And the implications can be very serious. Yes, uh, because uh, these, these clots can, can occur in multiple different organs. A lot of them occur in, in, in the lungs. They can develop blood clots in the legs. They can develop pulmonary emboli, blood clots in some of the uh, internal organs. You mentioned strokes, heart attacks. So any organ can be affected by these. So you set out to try to understand what's actually going on. Yes. One of the things that uh, was, was fascinating to me is how this seemingly simple virus that was mainly a respiratory virus, very similar to viruses that cause the common cold, caused such severe multi-organ failure in a small percentage of the, of the population. Many people, they get the virus, they have a fever, they cough, they might feel bad and have muscle aches for a few days. Uh, and then just get better. And then another patient will come in and have uh, not only blood clots, but uh, develop respiratory failure and develop kidney problems and the strokes and the heart attacks. And why? Uh, so we were very uh, suspicious of a part of the immune system getting activated. And the, this part of the immune system is called complement. It was named hundreds of years ago because it was thought to complement antibodies. But it turns out that it really uh, is a major effector of, of the immune system. And there are many diseases that complement is activated that cause not only blood clotting, but also very similar manifestations of COVID, uh, that you see in COVID, like these multi-organ uh, problems. So some people, when they think about blood clotting, they think about platelets, which are the cells that are uh, associated with clotting, but complement's not directly related to platelets, is it? Well, ma many diseases that uh, activate complement have thrombocytopenia or low platelet counts. So it, it is a, a secondary effect, but not, not a, a primary problem. So when complement is working like it's supposed to, what happens in the body? Well, complement is there to actually protect us from uh, invading organisms, bacteria, viruses, etc. So, so complement is an important part of our immune system. But just like the immune system with B cells and T cells uh, and antibodies, if it's overly activated, it can cause a lot of destruction. So you've, you've heard of autoimmune diseases 
there the immune system is revved up and starts attacking our own body. And COVID is doing a very similar thing. So how did you go about studying whether, in fact, complement was involved in COVID? Yeah, so we, we, we actually looked at a lot of the proteins on uh, this, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the virus that causes COVID-19. And the most prominent proteins are the spike proteins. And the spike proteins is uh, kind of where it gets its name. They're uh, the proteins that form the corona or the crown, and that's why it's called coronavirus. And uh, so these proteins bind to the cell and they activate complement. So we wanted to understand which part of complement they were activating. And what we were able to find uh, was that they are activating a particular pathway known as the alternative pathway of complement. And uh, we were able to actually figure out exactly what they bind to. The interesting thing here is most people have focused on the ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2, as the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. That's the entry protein. And it's true that the virus uses that receptor, if you will, to get inside the cell. But what what the spike proteins actually bind to first uh, is something called heparin sulfate, which is on the lining of cells. And that's what concentrates the virus so that it can gain access to the uh, ACE2 receptor. And does that heparin sulfate then interact with the complement system in some way? It does. So, so there is an important regulator of the complement cascade. It's known as factor H. And factor H competes with that spike protein for the same binding site. Uh, so, so what it does is it prevents one of the negative regulators of complement from functioning. And that leads to a lot of activation of complement. And this explains potentially a lot of the endothelial damage that is going on in these patients. So what I'm hearing you say is you have factor H, which is sort of keeping this immune pathway of complement in check. Right. And then the coronavirus comes and perhaps the spike protein on the end knocks off factor H and, and that allows complement to rev up. That's exactly correct. And then what happens from there? So the alternative pathway is activated. How does that lead to a clot? Right. So, so it, it can lead to a lot of things. So one of the classic things about all complement-driven diseases, and there's they go by lots of long names. The, uh, there's acronyms such as atypical uh, HUS or AHUS and, and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or PNH. These are all complement-driven disorders, but they all clot. And, and they all are more or less resistant to the traditional anticoagulants. And that's what got us thinking about this as a mechanism uh, in the first place. So they are having complement, especially the alternative pathway revved up, causes endothelial damage and clotting in a lot of diseases. And uh, that is one of the major mechanisms. There's also, we know that heparin, which is very similar to heparin sulfate, also it works through antithrombin-3. And antithrombin-3 also binds to heparin sulfate. So there's a chance that the spike protein is also interfering with the effects of heparin. Heparin being the medicine people get to thin yes, the blood. the blood thinner. So in theory, this could be an explanation for why people aren't responding as easily to heparin who have COVID-19. That's correct. So um, we're talking about fundamentally the basic mechanism of how this virus could be causing clotting. Could you talk a little bit about the implications if this theory turns out to be true? That if, if this is another kind of complement disorder, like these other rare diseases, but now not so rare because we have a pandemic, what, what are the implications? And would it mean, uh, for, let me ask you first, does this have implications because people don't all share exactly the same complement system? Sort of. So, so I think what's going on is that there's really two diseases here. There's the virus itself that, like I said, most people will, will get over and recover from with a mild to moderate viral illness. And then there's this small half a percent, one percent, point one percent 
of the population that gets a very severe disease with multi-organ involvement and endothelial damage. We know that about 0.1 to 1% of the population carries mutations, germline mutations that they inherit from their, their, their parents that regulate complement differently. And so, so it might be that the people that get so sick have a double hit. They have an underlying predisposition genetically, and then they get the SARS-CoV-2 virus that activates complement, and they can't regulate it. And the biggest hint of that is one of the biggest predispositions to, to having intubation or severe disease is a seemingly unrelated disease called age-related macular degeneration. And this came out of research that was done up in, in New York. This is a disease of the eye. That's correct. But this disease of the eye has a very rare polymorphism that is important in regulating factor H. And actually where the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binds to heparin sulfate is the same location as the mutation or the polymorphism that you see in age-related macular degeneration. So it is conceivable that if people have mutations that are important in regulating complement that really wouldn't do anything unless they had a strong trigger, like SARS-CoV-2 or a major surgery or a major uh, infection, that that's the group that's getting so sick. So in other words, a disease like age-related macular degeneration may be linked to a particular um, variation in complement. And that same variation in complement may be particularly susceptible to the virus. Yes. And there are other mutations in, in complement that also regulate it uh, that could also be there that could make this more severe. And that's the next aspect of our, our research. We are actually sequencing the complement genes. And if our hypothesis is correct, we're going to see overrepresentation of these mutations in the patients that get most sick. The implication of that is we now have a target to go after therapeutically. And there are drugs that can target the complement cascade. And that may be uh, an, an effective treatment if, if we can uh, put these two together. In other words, you might be able to know a little bit more about the mechanism of clotting and have treatments focused on that rather than the general blood thinners, which have been hard to utilize in this situation. Yes. And it's not just uh, the clotting, it's, it's uh, some of the endothelial damage uh, that, because uh, one of the major roles of complement is to protect the endothelium. So if complement is uh, too activated, you can get things like seizures and strokes and, and coronary artery disease. So it's not just the endothelium of the, of the venous system, but also the arterial system uh, can get damaged by this. And, and this would give us a targeted therapy. How far away are we from therapies that target complement in this way? Well, there are trials uh, that are already underway. There are multinational randomized controlled trials that are underway testing these complement inhibitors. For COVID, they're testing it for COVID. Yes, and, and we know these drugs are, are, are pretty safe. And we know that there is, um, we're seeing the inflammation go down very quickly uh, in these clinical trials, quickly in like days. But as any good public health person will tell you, uh, you, you really need to prove this in, in a randomized trial. And that's being done. But we can target, the drug that's being used is not targeting the exact location. It should mitigate it. But I think we can target it even better now that we understand the mechanism and where complement is being activated. I really appreciate your walking me through this. It, it really gives you a sense of how you start with a clinical observation that people are getting clots and strokes and heart attacks, and you're getting down all the way to the level of where the virus binds onto cells to figure out what could be going on. And then you're exploring what could be done to stop the virus at that level. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the epidemiology and the research around uh, the binding and everything has, has been fantastic, and there's been enormous progress. But we, mechanistically, we really haven't figured out what to target. And, and again, you know, 
we need to take this further. We need to put the genetics together uh, with the binding. We need to show that the therapeutic can 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 work by blocking that area. Certainly, we were able to block this in vitro in the lab. We were completely able to shut off the complement system by by blocking just upstream of where it binds. Uh, but you, uh, we need randomized controlled trials to show that this works in patients. Well. Um Wish you the best for that research. Thank you so much for taking a minute to explain this all to me. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.